Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for coming back after lunch. Um, I will uh, try to make it worth your while to, to stay awake. Um, I, I thought the topic of uh, the day was very interesting. Um, it's one that I've been thinking about it. And I think as a community, um, we've been on this path to really understand what are the structures, the principles that we need um, in terms of having good uh, scientific practices? And so what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about my own journey and the ones that I've carried out with some of my collaborators towards this. I'm not going to take a really strong stand on uh, you know, the alchemy or science debate or on the theory versus experimental debate either. Um, I think both theory and experiments are absolutely essential to the progress of most sciences, including machine learning. Um, but what I will talk about is more on the empirical side, certainly, things that we've learned. Um, most of my work, my expertise is in a branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning. I'll give you a taste of this. But I would say a lot of the findings that I will present apply more broadly to machine learning than just that. In particular, I will talk about these three R's. Reproducibility, reusability, and robustness. And the thread that I see carrying through those three notions is the following, um, out of a report from a few years ago from the NSF. The idea that reproducibility really refers to the ability for a researcher, more and more often a team of researchers, to duplicate the results of a prior study using similar material as were used by the original investigator. In particular, this last point that reproducibility is the minimum necessary condition for a finding, and I'll talk mostly about for an empirical finding, to be believable and informative. So a finding on which we can construct our science. And so that's essentially my program for, uh, for today, exploring these aspects and how they pertain to recent findings in machine learning. Um, just to tie this to the broader context, we've heard about this reproducibility crisis in science. This is from a 2016 article in the journal Nature asking 1,500 scientists, is there a reproducibility crisis? 52% um, said yes, a significant crisis. Another 38% said yes, a slight crisis. Um, after that, there was about 77% who said, I don't know. I don't know what they were doing in that survey. Um, about 3% said no crisis, no problem, business as usual. Um, and then they tried to break this up a little bit further, asking uh, by fields. And because we have people from various fields today, it's interesting to know. I don't know if there are too many chemists in the room. Probably they're back in their lab trying to reproduce their experiments. They're having a hard time. The top line is the chemist. Um, almost 90% of them have at some point failed to reproduce results from somebody else's experiment. And over 60% of them have at some point failed to reproduce results of their own experiments. Um, and so they're having a tough time. The biologists are not far behind. Even the physicists um, face some challenge in this respect. Computer science isn't there. It is not a reason to think that we don't uh, share some of these same challenges. In fact, we've done a smaller since then informal version of this and had similar numbers to what we're seeing in mathematics uh, in terms of the, the incidence of difficulty in reproducing previous work. And, and what's interesting to me here is the gap between the difficulty in reproducing somebody else's work and your own is actually not that big. Um, that both of these cases can pose problems. So that raises some interesting question. Let me tell you a little bit about reinforcement learning if you're not familiar with this particular area. Um, the concepts will be very familiar with you, for most of you. It's actually inspired by literature in behavioral psychology. The principle being that on the psychology side, there's a whole body of work that argues that you can train an agent. You can think of a pet, a child. You can train that agent to shape their behavior by presenting a set of rewards or consequences. And so through this system of positive and negative signals, you can shape the behavior of the agent towards a behavior that you deem optimal. And so in computer science, these principles were formalized around the mid-1980s by researchers that posited a specific mathematical formulation of this problem, whereby the context was defined by a notion of state. Usually we assume we have a Markovian chain that defines how the state change over time. And actions are applied by the agent to induce change in the state. 
So there's dynamic system, it changes over time. So it's a good way to model many, many different problems, whether it's a robot navigating in an environment or any uh, dynamic control system. In addition to this, there's a notion of a reward. And the goal of the agent is to pick actions such as, maxima, such as to maximize reward. And more specifically, most of the time we're interested in maximizing the sum of reward over the trajectory, so the lifetime of the agent. And in the case of uh, non-deterministic system, we're interested in maximizing the expectation of the sum of the reward over the, the trajectory. And so it's a very general framework. It applies to a huge number of problems. And the additional piece that's quite nice about this framework is it include a notion of an agent training against itself. So Jan was alluding to some of the earlier results, really this notion that an agent can learn to play chess, can learn to play poker, can learn to play Go using self-training. So these are some of the really impressive results we've seen in recent years. 2016 uh, results of the AlphaGo system, maybe it was 2015. 2015, 2016, AlphaGo system beating the world champion in the very challenging Chinese game of Go. More recently, a system called Libratus played poker in a particular version of poker at the level of the best humans using the framework of reinforcement learning. Now, if you go back to the original framework to solve these games, you can imagine that the state space for these games is enormous. The number of different board configurations in Go or the number of different um, card embedding configurations for poker. The number of actions may be varied also depending on the size. The reward function is very simple. If at the end of the game you win, you get a positive reward and throughout the game there's no reward that is obtained until the game ends. And if you lose, you get a negative reward. Beyond these very impressive success in games, there's a tremendous potential for using reinforcement learning to train AI agents that interact with the world. So in contrast to most machine learning, where the agent is static and only designed to make predictions, a lot of machine learning is only about making predictions, in this case we have agents that are deeply interactive with the environment, have the ability to change the state of the environment and to acquire reward. And so the space of applications, this is drawn from a recent a series of symposiums on the topic of reinforcement learning. We've seen applications, of course, in robotics and games, but also medical intervention system, improving automatic improvement of algorithms, managing agricultural crops, autonomous driving, prosthetic arm control, fire force management, financial trading. The space is very, very large, and there's many people exploring this technology. In our own group, we've used it for the autonomous control of an intelligent wheelchair. We have also used it in a series of experiments um, in collaboration with colleagues at the Montreal Neurological Institute, where we're looking at controlling a neurostimulation device, device that applies stimulation to the brain in real time for patients with epilepsy. And in that case, the choice of action is what is the precise optimal timing of the stimulation and how do we minimize the number of seizures over the lifetime of the patient, as well as minimizing the number of stimulation actions to preserve the battery life. So really, a lot of potential, but of course, as you can imagine, really challenging conditions. The amount of data with which we can train this system is relatively small, especially when you're dealing with patients. I must say that at this stage, all of our work on adaptive neurostimulation was done in an animal model of epilepsy, an in vitro model rather than with human subjects. Because through this interactive, interactive learning, there's the ability to uh, visit states of the system that you haven't seen before. And so the risk can be quite high. So for now, we're doing this in animal models. The real challenge, the question, when you tackle one of these applications, is really the fact that you're not going to have all that much data to train the system. So if we look at how much data is necessary to train a reinforcement learning agent in a game, we're talking about hundreds of millions of samples in some cases. And there's no way that I can run that many experiments, even in an animal model of epilepsy. When I've do, done my work, in terms of these in vitro slice models, we usually have recordings from about a dozen slices over maybe a few hours of recording from each of them. It's a small amount of data. So I can't start learning a very, very complex policy about this space. It's necessary to be able to do a lot of the learning in simulation, or at least in simulation to select the right type of algorithms architectures. We talked earlier about this knobs, like the space of knobs that I need, essentially the function space that I'm going to use to express the behavior of my agent. I need to be able to learn this in a different setup. 
And so really this question of what findings from the literature which have been published using reinforcement learning in <coughs> simulation and in games, how much of that can I translate to the problems that I'm trying to solve on the medical intervention side where I have at most 100, maybe 1,000 trials to train and evaluate my algorithm. And so in most of these cases, we turn to the literature, um, trying to assess which of the results are most reliable, seem most promising. This is a quick graph um, up to 2018 of the number of papers published in reinforcement learning. I started working in this field around 2000. At that time, there was on the order of maybe 2000 papers published a year. Um, as of 2018, there's over 20,000 papers published in reinforcement learning. So, you know, just trying to figure out from this wild set of papers, which are the most promising ideas to train neurostimulation devices is a little bit daunting. If I have questions about the reproducibility of the work and the reusability, I'm in even worse a state. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, the body of work to consider isn't the 20,000 papers published last year, it's actually the area under the curve, so the cumulative set of all of these papers from the last 20 years or so is what I have to contend with. Um, and so we started doing some of that work um, and in doing so and trying to reproduce some of these papers, assess which one were most promising for our application, we came across a few uh, surprises uh, indicating that things weren't quite as advertised in the papers, which is what launched me into this study of uh, replication reproducibility. So let me tell you about one specific piece of these papers. There's a set of these papers that are, um, use deep learning within reinforcement learning. And so the idea is that we're going to train our agent, but the particular function class we look at to train our agent is the one where the policy of the agent, you can think of the policy as the strategy that the agent is cho using to choose action, this function that expresses what's the probability of choosing my different actions is represented by a neural network. So this is my neural network over here. Pi is my policy. I'll have a few equations for those of you um, who enjoy equations, um, but at a very simple level should be intuitive for everyone. And so I have this neural network. The neural network tells me what's the probability of choosing each of the actions. And I'm trying to maximize, again, my cumulative reward. We call this a return. And there's a nice gradient expression to do that that incorporates the policy, the value function estimation, and the distribution of the state. So depending on which state my policy tells me to visit, I'm going to get a different distribution of rewards. And these kinds of approaches are used for continuous control applications. So cases where there's a continuous spaces of action, some of them in robotics, some of them in um, medical control problems. If I look at the literature, just on policy gradient methods, which I think is promising for my neurostimulation device, even in 2018, huge set of papers. We had the NeurIPS conference in December, a few dozen papers on this topic, even 2018, looking at other conferences, many, many of them. And so I'm not today gonna give you the whole review of all of these papers. The main point I think that's important is that all of these papers, when presenting the results, compare empirically to just a small number of baseline algorithms. And essentially, there's sort of four baseline algorithms that come back over and over again as the reference point to which people compare. So if I want to be able to compare these results one with the other, I have to see how to compare them to the same set of common benchmarks. And so we started looking just at these four algorithms to see, I think the point was made earlier today, that in many cases when someone is writing a paper about a new algorithm, when they um, choose a baseline to compare to, sometimes the, uh, the, the results are not always as good as they should be and there's been cases of someone kind of stepping in and doing it better after the fact. So this is essentially a little bit what we tried to do. So we started looking at these and we considered this simulator, this Majoko domain, little, they call it the half cheetah, it's a little, um, character uh, that learns to run. So in this case, the policy that we're learning is the control in the joints, in each of the joint of the character to make it run and um, not fall on its face or on its belly. And so if I show you the results of the four algorithms, this is more on the methodology side, so you don't really need to know which is best or not. If I show you the results of these four, it really seems like algorithm red is the winner in this task. And so if I want to use these results to figure out what to do in neurostimulation based on this particular 
study, I would go on and use algorithm red. And we started looking at a few other tasks just to be extra sure of our results. There's a hopper environment and a swimmer, which are variants on this. And suddenly, the ordering of the algorithms varied quite a bit. All of them are policy gradient algorithm. They use a neural network to learn the policy. The difference between them is essentially some variance in terms of um, regularization over the policy space. And so in these other hopper and swimmer environment, the algorithm blue is suddenly a lot better. Red actually performs the worst on both of these. These three domains are all from the same simulator. They all use the same physics engine underlying it. So we can assume that the dynamics between the three is much more similar than the dynamics between those in a human brain suffering from epilepsy. It's very hard to know what to conclude. A student of mine was doing these experiments and said, well, maybe, you know, you didn't do the implementation right. You have a bug in there somewhere. What's going on? So the student said, well, I actually used some code from the web. Fantastic. We love open source code. I said, well, did you use a good library from the web? He said, well, there's a lot of them. This is a whole set of different code bases that are available for TRPO, one of the four algorithms I showed you. He said, I'll try a few more. So he tried three of them. And this is the result he got for the three different code bases of the same algorithm. Very different results. It's hard to know. We thought maybe TRPO is just a very unstable algorithm. No one's able to make it work properly. Try one of the other ones. He tried DDPG, which is another of the four algorithms I presented. Same thing. Three different code bases, really different results based on which code base you use. Um, and this is a real problem right now because many um, people are making code available, which is fantastic, which I fully support. But unless you have very good experimental methodology to go along with the use of that code, it's very hard to get conclusive results. Going beyond that, we started digging in about why were the results so different. And in this case, most of the packages come with a set of predefined hyperparameters. Zach talked about hyperparameters earlier, right? The learning rate, the number of nodes, and the arrangement, the architecture between them, how they're connected. So we started playing about the structure of the neural network, how many nodes, how many layers. We started talking, uh, playing with the function, the activation function inside each of the nodes. And we found a lot of variety to the results that we were getting. We played with a few more things, and really the, the finding that came back after this was that in many papers that were published, people were not doing a very thorough job at picking the right set of hyperparameter for the baseline methods. There was a strong incentive to pick the best set of configurations for your own method, but the motivation suddenly sort of fell off uh, the road when it came to finding good hyperparameters for competing methods. And so that seems like a simple methodology problem to fix, right? There should be a fair amount of budget, experimental budget, given both to your new algorithm and to the baselines you're comparing to. And so you should use the same amount of data for both of them. You should use the same amount of computation for both of them. And that should be sufficient to make it a fair comparison. So this is happening over the course of many months. We have back and forth. I meet the students every week. Every time they come back with a new graph, they come back the week after, they said, great, Joelle, we took your advice. We did exactly the same computational budget for two approaches. This is the result we got. And I said, perfect. Finally, we have an answer. We have a winner. Algorithm orange is doing better than algorithm blue. I said, which one is it? Who's the winner? What are we doing? The student said, well, there's a little problem. Both of this are TRPO algorithm with the same code base. In both cases, we found the best hyperparameter optimization. And um, we ran five runs of each, and this is what we get. That was a little bit of a discouraging moment. Um, and so I said, well, how many runs did you do of each of these two supposedly called experiments? I said, well, five runs of each. I said, RL algorithms, as I mentioned earlier, are known to be, they can be quite unstable to their initial parameter configuration. Clearly, you haven't done enough. I said, you know, how to measure confidence interval. We went back to the early formulas. And he said, you know, you've got this N down here that controls your confidence interval. Depending on how many experiments you run, you should have better confidence. I said, well, there's a little problem with all of this, Joel. When we look in the literature, this is the number of N that people are using for their experiments. <laughs> 
And my goal here isn't to pick on specific research groups or results, but the number of trials is typically very small because these are expensive to run. Um, and so many of them have at most five trials, a few of them three. Three to nine means depending on which problem they had different number of trials. And then there's this unusual thing that happened when I say top five, top two, top three. Some teams actually don't tell you how many trials they run. They don't tell you how many experiments. They just report the top K results and they tell you what that K is, but they don't really tell you what the N is. And let me be very clear about what happens when you do this. This is what happens when you run 10 trials of an experiment. And if you report just the top three results, not only do things look significantly better, but also the variance looks a lot smaller. And this was um, quite often done in the reinforcement learning literature at the time. Um, and so this wasn't a very good story. And when we started calling out this behavior, and not only us, other people had started noticing this too, it led to these wonderful headlines, right? Uh, reinforcement learning never worked, deep only helped a bit, um, and reinforcement learning's foundational flaw, and all these kinds of alarmist titles. Um, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I do think this is cause for concern. And so we modified our story a bit and said, for fair empirical comparison and to make sure that we have sound experimental result, because this is really my message. It's not about doing theory or experiments. It's about we are doing experiments. A lot of our findings are coming from experiments, so let's at least do them well so that we can trust the findings. And so we need to think about how do we draw robust conclusions, and that can include having methods that have a different set of hyperparameters and different variable sensitivity, and what method is best is going to depend on lots of these factors. And if you have a very small computation budget, maybe a particular method is best. If you have a very large computation budget, another method might seem best. And so we started being a little bit more thorough in our investigation of the literature. Um, we published this, so everything I've told you so far, we published in early 2018, um, and it got quite a bit of attention, at least it was re uh, released on archive at that time, even maybe late 2017. Um, and through the year, we were hoping it would help uh, improve experimental practice in the field. Um, and so at the end of 2018, this is December 2018, we went back and we said we're going to do a survey, a sample of 50 papers in reinforcement learning from 2018 to see if they've improved their experimental practice. And this is what we found. We picked 50 papers. All of them had experiments. So we were looking at empirical methods. So that's a good start. 90% um, of them used neural networks inside their experiment. A few of them used different function approximators. Um, all the hyperparameters used were described in the paper. For 90% of papers, they described what hyperparameters they were using in their experiment. That was encouraging. Um, in many cases, they didn't always describe which hyperparameters they were using for the baseline methods. So about 60% of papers gave us enough information that we could reproduce the baseline, not just their contribution. 55% uh, of them provided a link to code, um, so we were able to run the code in those cases. 20% of them only told us what methodology they use to select hyperparameters. And by this, I mean if you use a learning rate, what is the range of value of learning rates that you considered before choosing a particular one, right? So for the baseline, 60% of them are telling me what learning rate they're using, but only 20% are telling me what's the space of values that they considered. Uh, the, vari the evaluation on a holdout test set were only present in 10% of cases, which we'll discuss why that's a little complicated for reinforcement learning. Significance testing was applied, proper significance testing was applied in 5% of papers. Um, and so that may be part of why we are in uh, deep trouble. Uh, and so there's a lot of papers that had this kind of thing. You don't see it over there, it's much better on my screen, but around each of these lines there's a little bit of shading that is around there and it seems like there's like a margin of something, um, but most of them who put this margin of something didn't define what it was. Is it a 95% confidence interval? Is it a standard error? Is it an empirical variance? I don't know, shading looks nice, I put some shading in. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I must say, I have been guilty of this. We went back to the original paper that we had produced um, 
on the initial results and we found one graph where we hadn't properly defined our notion of confidence on the graph, so we, we fixed that. Um, and at that point, we started thinking like, you know, even with good intentions, trying to look at the question of reproducibility, we find that we don't satisfy our own criteria and some of our own recent work, we haven't done that. We haven't stepped up to the level of um, quality that we're asking others to do. And so we started thinking of how can we do better and we hit about the idea of having a reproducibility checklist. And so this is something that we've been uh, starting to use in many cases. The idea of a checklist is really to just have a set of criteria that can be systematically applied when presenting results. And so if your paper contains an algorithm, it should have a description of the algorithm, some analysis of the complexity, a link to downloadable code if possible. If you make any theoretical claims, it's not going to be surprising that you should have a statement of the results a clear explanation of any assumptions, and of course a proof of the claims. Otherwise, really, it's hard to verify your claims. And where things get interesting is really if you have some plots and tables and numerical results, here are the lists of things we consider important to include in your paper. Some description of the data collection, a downloadable version of the data, any description of data that was excluded from your experimentation, the range of hyperparameters, the number of evaluation runs, how the experiments were won, which metrics are used, both the central tendency as well as a notion of variation. I don't insist on any specific notion. You can use standard deviation, confidence interval, quartiles. Use one of them and tell us which one it is. And ideally, the computing infrastructure used. So we started circulating this idea. Um, we are in contact with several of the main conferences and journals in the field such that they apply this to the papers um, at submission time as part of the review process. The NeurIPS conference actually used a version of the checklist when um, accepting the final paper submission in January. Um, so we'll see if that has an incidence on the quality of the empirical science presented. I'll insist a little bit on that last point, which is the notion of the computing infrastructure used. There's a long uh, history in other fields of science about the fact that really reproducibility can be largely affected by the empirical setup. There's been cases of you know, two teams trying to produce the same results and they feel like they've controlled absolutely everything and then there's some weird issue that they haven't been able to account for that turns out to be responsible uh, for the discrepancy in the results. We often see it in biomedical research where when you have a study that's conducted with several different sites, different hospitals, um, one of the clearest determinant of outcome is the site ID, uh, which seems really counterintuitive, but that's sort of a catch-all for all the things that are not necessarily controlled. In our own research, the infrastructure is usually computing infrastructure. For the most part, CPU infrastructure is quite De predictable, deterministic, replicable. But when we start to do more and more training on GPUs, we're dealing with distributed computation system, depending what's the schedule on this distributed computation, there actually can be variance between two different experiments. So that's something that we have to start taking into account. Okay, having said this, let me tell you a little bit more about what are some of the challenges that we face in reinforcement learning and what we might do going forward to um, improve our record. So there's a, there's a statement that has been um, said um, that says that, you know, reinforcement learning is the only case of machine learning where it's actually acceptable to test on your training set. And certainly if you're doing supervised learning, this seems like a capital sin of machine learning to report results on your training set rather than an independent test set. And, and let me tell you what happens, why we do this in reinforcement learning. Most of the cases that we see, we use, this is the left side of the graph, we have a task. Maybe we have a robot running in a little maze trying to find the goal, the cheese in this case. And the robot learns in that one task. And when we feel like the robot has a good policy, we take the policy in the same task and we run it in that same task. And if there's not a lot of variability in the task, that means that we're essentially training and testing in the same task. And that task generates a data set and it's essentially the same if there's not enough variability. At the other end of the spectrum, we have this notion of AGI, artificial general intelligence, this is essentially what we're aiming for, right? The notion of AGI is essentially that you could, 
test on the world as your test set, that you can deploy an AI agent and really the real world is the test set for that, incredibly general. And so RL is really most of the time the work is done in that left side and we're pretending that we want to get towards that right side. And so in some of our work we've proposed different mechanisms to start moving outside of this classical RL paradigm of training and testing on the same tasks. Some groups have advocated the use of different tasks for training and for testing. So you'll train your robot in one maze and then you'll test in a different maze that usually get captured under the umbrella of transfer learning where you have a training environment and a test environment. These two yield different distribution of data. And so we wanted to explore something that wasn't necessarily um, going as far as uh, that. And uh, we formalized the notion that it was really important to have a different set of random seeds and use different set of random seeds for training and for testing. This is not really super creative. This is just kind of good basic um, statistics in this case. And so we've formulated a notion of generalization and reinforcement learning where the return is evaluated separately <coughs> on the training and the test seeds and we look at the difference between those two as our notion of generalization error. You would be surprised how few seeds you need until that generalization gap goes to zero. So we tried this, we said we're going to sample a bunch of random numbers, put a bunch of them as my training seed, a different bunch of them as my test seed and this shows you for different numbers of training seeds, um, what's my generalization gap. And for as few as like 10, in purple down here I'm at like 10 test seeds and I have essentially memorized the task to the point that in testing I always reach the same performance as in training. Um, this is an acrobat task, so you have kind of a two-jointed system that is trying to swing up and balance the system. I have colleagues at McGill in Robotics, David Meager, Greg Dudek, some of these students, they built a robot that does this um, and then I assure you it does not take just 10 tries for the robot to be able to learn this task. And so there's something in the natural world in terms of variability that is much, much richer than what we're seeing in some of our simulation environment for reinforcement learning. The natural world has incredible complexity and somehow a lot of the research in reinforcement learning isn't yet um, accessing that complexity, hasn't been able to engage with that full complexity. And part of the issue with reinforcement learning is that you need this interaction between the agent and the environment and frankly it's very complicated, very expensive to do all of your learning with a real robot in the real world. And so the domains that we tend to use for our work are simulation, simulation of game agents. I've shown you the little half uh, cheetah which is part of the Mujoko simulator. There's other cases where we learn to play Atari games, the old Atari games. Um, and most of these simulators that are used in almost all of the literature, those 20,000 papers, I would say 95% of them use these kinds of simple benchmarks. There's very few initial states, there's deterministic dynamics to the system and in fact the simulator itself can be written down with just a few lines of codes, many of them under 100 kilobytes. That is essentially the description length of the domain. Um, I, I assure you that the natural world, the description length of the natural world is not on the order of 100 kilobytes. There's incredible richness and variety and if we're going to achieve AGI we're going to have to build methods that tackle that in their experimental setting. And so since then we've proposed a sequence, essentially a curriculum of tasks for reinforcement learning that build on information from the natural world. We've showed that you can use images. This is data from the CIFAR image data set where that image, um, essentially there's an agent that navigates over the image space at any time point, just sees a little portion of the image, learns to go up and down, left and right, sort of a simulated robot. In that case the observation comes from real images from the real world. And so we have that kind of random signal piped into our RL system and you see over time that it discovers, it learns to discover the whole image and at the end to get the reward it has to declare that it has found the right object, in this case the right kind of flower. I don't know how many of you are experts with flowers but this is a lantana camera it turns out according to the data set. And so if we do that we train RL agents with that, we see that it takes many, many more 
training seeds in order to get to a zero size generalization gap, really on the order of um, about 10,000 training seeds. So we're seeing a lot more variants. And as a result, we're building RL agents that are a lot more robust. We've done a version of this where we take the standard Atari games that have been used to train RL agent, used extensively this sort of the standard benchmark right now in the literature on reinforcement learning to be able to do well in these kinds of games. This is a game called Breakout, where you get to control a little pallet at the bottom, the little blue line at the bottom gets to move, and as a result of where it hits, the ball goes up and tries to break the bricks. Simple enough, completely deterministic, very easy to learn. Um, we added, instead of the back, black background, we piped in real video to sample a video from the web. There's a lot of videos on the web. You can get different videos for training and for testing. The game dynamics essentially stayed the same, but the variety of the observation space is incredibly rich, and now you can start having a fair training and testing separation between the two sets. So it allows essentially you know, endless variety, but on a very controlled set of tasks. And we have colleagues um, at uh, Facebook AI Research um, and Facebook Reality Labs and Georgia Tech who've gotten together, and they're essentially using uh, video data from real apartments. They go around in people's apartments. Um, they get video data from all of this, and they use all this data to train this 3D emulator. They're essentially simulating the world, and now you have an agent that can navigate inside that world. You can get the agent to find your keys or get to the door. There's a whole set of tasks that goes along with it. The beautiful thing is it's essentially a controllable simulation environment, but that environment is built from real data. So you start having some of the natural data informing the environments in which our reinforcement learning agents train. You don't have to maintain a real robot. You don't have to do a you know, preparation of uh, rat in vitro models. You can actually test reinforcement learning algorithms in really challenging scenarios. Okay, so I think in terms of this you know, question of you know, myth or fact is reinforcement learning condemned to always test on the training set, I think the answer is clearly no. Um, but I think it's also really a call uh, to uh, wake up in terms of thinking carefully about what experimental paradigm we use when we do empirical science in terms of the claims that we can make. Um, and so i have uh, always encouraging my, my students to think of how to step out into the real world when trying to develop new algorithms. Yes, the theory matters. Yes, the algorithm development matters. But it also matters to confront these mathematical construct against reality, against real data, and to see whether your assumptions are actually consistent with what we're observing in the real world. And, and just a final word, really, I think a message for the, for the machine learning community that we, I've been trying to share with that community um, is really embracing this notion that um, science is a collective institution. And what we're really trying to do is explain, explain knowledge, explain natural phenomenon. Um, and to do that, we need to embrace both the theoretical and the empirical. Once in a while, a checklist is useful. If you see a need for one, it's available on my website. Feel free to reach out. Um, and we've also been uh, promoting this iClear reproducibility challenge to encourage the community to engage in this effort. We've had two editions so far, um, whereby iClear is a conference where the papers during the review period are available online anonymously. Uh, Jan was one of the founder of that conference. It's a very healthy and growing community, and over the last two years, during the review period, we've actually invited researchers, young researchers, sometimes graduate students, across um, the world. And I think Sanjeev's class has participated in this. Uh, they responded to the call and they used it as a project in a graduate course. Um, students are asked to replicate one of the papers during the review period, and they can share the findings of their replication work online with the authors in exchange with them through an anonymous form. So it's a nice opportunity to get participative science. If some of you come out of this and feel like you want to learn more about deep reinforcement learning, we've released a, a survey, which is a, a monograph uh, on the topic of deep reinforcement learning. It's available for free online, so you can download it and read it. 
Um, and of course, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today. Um, I get to have great conversations, but back in the lab is a group of fantastic collaborators, both at McGill and Facebook AI Research. And so I just want to finish by acknowledging their fantastic work. Thank you.